So thank you, Nancy. Um, yes, I, I'm originally from England and uh, um, lived in Utah now for, well, this is my eighth year. Really enjoy it here, love the, the snow and the skiing as well as the hiking in the summer and uh, all the great, wonderful local food, the farmer's market uh, we have here in Cache Valley. We grow amazing vegetables, I would say, as well as amazing peaches. So, yes, I'm going to try and explain today uh, a little bit about what is organic and sustainable agriculture. Here's a brief overview of my, what I want to talk about. And first of all, I'd like to address why organic and, ag you know, organic and sustainable agriculture. Why are we even talking about this? And then what is organic and sustainable agriculture? And weave into that uh, the implied question, well, is organic farming sustainable, right? Uh, that's what everybody's interested in and talking about. And finally, I just have a few slides to look at the topic of organic food and whether or not it's healthier. Um, so why organic and sustainable agriculture? Well, we should be clear that our current uh, agricultural system, what many of us call conventional farming, has been incredibly successful at increasing world, the world supply of food. So this, this graph here starts in the 1960s, the, the start of what we know as the Green Revolution. And since then, world food production has more than doubled. And that is really an incredible achievement. You can see that world food production has kept pace with world population growth. And back in the 60s, there was real concern that with the forecasted uh, population growth, we weren't going to be able to feed everyone. So, so this, was really, uh, this really is a wonderful achievement. Um, however, it has come at a cost. And that cost has been widespread environmental degradation, including soil loss from erosion and uh, loss of wildlife habitat, uh, pollution of waterways, even groundwater. And um, just as concerning, uh, with the increasing rise of uh, fossil fuels, we see um, food prices really mirroring uh, global gas prices. And the reason for that is, is that conventional farming is, you know, is so productive because it's using all these inputs uh, derived from fossil fuels. And so obviously we know fossil fuels are a finite resource and they're only continuing to, to get more expensive, and at least in the long term, not right now, but um, we, can, we can expect then that this will have a drastic influence on food prices in the future. Obviously there are widespread public concerns about pesticides as well, both their effects in the environment as well as on people. And along with that, uh, we have increasing rates of pesticide resistance in our um, uh, insect pests as well as our weeds. And this is expensive for the industry to keep up with, to keep developing new, new chemistries to stay ahead of the, the developing resistance. Finally, let's not forget the water crisis. Uh, we all, California has been in the news a lot recently, and this picture is actually taken uh, a long while ago um, in California, and it, it shows the subsidence of the ground as a result of overpumping of the aquifer. And so basically in 1925, the ground level was up here. In 1955, it had sunk to here, and by 1977, it was here. So uh, what's, if we over, over pump an aquifer, depending on the bedrock and that, you know, the, the, the uh, geology of that aquifer, it may collapse and then that resource is gone forever. So these concerns have, have really, over the years, prompted increasing debate, both among researchers and scientists, as well as the general public, on what we can do. Right? Uh, we have no doubt that in many regards, agriculture is phenomenally successful. But um, maybe we need to pay more attention to the environment as well as uh, 
um, society and social resources, in addition to yields in the bottom line, which have really been our traditional focuses. So then, is organic agriculture sustainable? So this, these words are actually used interchangeably by many. So, so when you hear sustainable agriculture spoken about, many will assume uh, that it's organic agriculture or something similar that we're talking about. And in fact, uh, practitioners and proponents often use the two words interchangeably. However, as a researcher, I find this problematic for the reason that if we're saying, if we're implying that sustainable agriculture is uh, organic agriculture, or perhaps sustainable agriculture is permaculture, or even sustainable agriculture is conventional agriculture, we're implying that that system is sustainable all over the world, regardless of the environment, regardless of the climate, and the, the culture of the local people. And so that's a pretty tall order. Um, instead, uh, I prefer to think of sustainable agriculture more as a, um, a goal and, a, and a, um, a we, that can be measured through a list of indicators. Right? And so if we have this vision for what sustainable agriculture should be, we can then develop a list of indicators that we can use to measure any individual farm to see how it measures up. Right? And so um, there's a lot of debate, uh, still ongoing debate, on what these indicators precisely should be. But just, just so you know, the, there is a definition of sustainable agriculture uh, in the 1990 Farm Bill, that rev well, the current Farm Bill, it was first put in there in 1990 and then revised in 2007. And these, these um, five points here are a synthesis of that definition. It was too long to share the entirety with you. And so basically, what this is, in, is saying is that if a farm is sustainable, it has to be productive because that's what farming is all about, right? Farming is about feeding people. And the yields it produces need to be of high quality. But it also needs to be economically viable, because unless a farmer can stay in business, why bother, right? However, for the, the sake of future generations, we need to make sure that our agriculture is environmentally safe and resource-consuming conserving, not consuming, right? We need, to, we need to conserve resources so that future generations can rely on them uh, as well as ourselves. And finally, and maybe this point is, is least addressed by the sustainability community as a whole, um, for agriculture to be sustainable, it has to be socially responsible. And that includes a decent living wage and quality of life for the farmer, as well as the farm worker and safe working environments, as well as being uh, an asset to the local community, enriching to the local community. So in other words, sustainability applies to the entire system, not just the bottom line, as you will often hear claimed. At least this is what myself and a, a growing number of researchers and, and sustainability advocates are claiming. So what about organic agriculture? Is it sustainable? Well, organic agriculture is different from simply sustainable agriculture, which is more of this umbrella term, because it's, it's actually codified in law. There are a series of requirements that any farmer who wants to use the coveted green seal has to meet in order to be allowed to use that seal and market his or her products as organic. Uh, the organic movement started a long time ago in the 1940s here in the US. Uh, and as it grew in popularity, uh, efforts were made to, to formalize it, to really as a means of establishing consumer trust and market um, identification. And so in 2002, this, uh, the USDA National Organic Program was, was implemented. 
And so this is, it's really a rigorous program. It requires growers to document with a paper trail each individual crop from planting through to harvest and to provide a farm plan and submit that to the, the local certifying agent every year and then to have an on-farm inspection. So your farm plan and your records are verified every year by a third-party certifier. So originally, you know, as I said, organic farming had a vision that was very rooted uh, in an environmental, earth-centered ethic. And so this, this is actually even uh, um, uh, evident in the National Organic Standards Board definition. So they have this on their website. And it says here that organic agriculture is an ecological production management system that promotes and enhances biodiversity biological cycles and soil biological activity. And it is based on minimal use of off-farm inputs and on management practices that restore, maintain, and enhance ecological harmony. So a real focus on the environment, right? Notice that it doesn't mention social sustainability. It also doesn't mention productivity in the bottom line. But it's, it's definitely a vision for an ecological production system. Despite this vision, organic farming has been criticized, especially since it became codified in law, as really relying on a series of, you know, shoulds and should nots in terms of technology, right? Allowed and not allowable technologies. And I think the reason for this is it's really impossible to codify into law something like a a biologically sustainable system, right? And so instead, uh, the National Organic Program has this um, list of uh, technologies that you can use or not. And for example, uh, exclude the use of any synthetic agrochemicals, right? Including GMOs, sewage sludge, because of the potential for industrial contamination in that. And instead, rely on a other technologies such as crop rotations, green manures, organic fertilizers, biological pest control, mechanical cultivation, and importantly, modern technology, because a lot of organic farming detractors will try and tell you that organic farming is simply harking back to the past, going back to what, the way our grandfathers farmed. And many of you may, may remember how backbreaking that was. Right? Many conventional farmers were delighted to be liberated from those days. And so, uh, but organic farming is in some respects going back to the methods of the past, but it also embraces current modern technologies. And I'm going to try and give you a little bit of a sense of that today. So, let's start with... Um, a little bit, of, little bit about the nitrogen cycle. So plants need to eat. They need to be fed, just like humans do. And, and plants take up nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium through their roots, as well as water, through their roots from the soil. Right? And so traditionally, we would have a nitrogen cycle that involved animals with manure returning to the soil, nitrogen-fixing legumes, fixing atmospheric nitrogen out of the air and enriching the soil. And all of this was then cycling. The plants would take up um, those, those nutrients, and then they decayed and returned organic matter to the soil, the carbon to the soil. And you can see then that the the animal manure in particular then is contributing to this enrichment of soil organic matter. So with the advent of uh, synthetic nitrogen fertilizers, this cycle was really circumvented. We were using fossil fuels to fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere instead of plants, right? And then we could directly feed plants by supplying readily available nutrients to the soil highly effective for growing productive plants. However, you are losing sight, potentially, of the role of soil organic matter in this process. So organic farmers, right from the beginning, this was really how organic farming got going, 
people were concerned that the new inorganic uh, nitrogen fertilizers were, would somehow harm the soil, right? And uh, because um, they did not contain any carbon, any, so any organic matter. So where does this organic matter come from? Well, animal manures we just discussed, but also plant. Plants grow, they take up nutrients, they fix carbon from the atmosphere, and this organic matter then is cycled in the, the soil by numerous organisms, ranging in size from bacteria and fungi to little nematodes, worm-like things, insects, uh, and also all the way up to soil-living organisms, earthworms, voles, um, and all these animals, through the breakdown in the carbon cycle, uh, really contribute to what we call soil health. So what is soil health or soil quality? Well, basically, um, this graph tries to illustrate that we have, as, as soil quality increases, or as uh, soil carbon in the soil uh, increases, this is sticking a little bit, Soil carbon is the black line. As that increases over time, soil quality increases. And soil quality attributes increase along with that. Attributes like soil aggregation and water infiltration. That's the blue line there. Or water holding and nutrient holding capacity. Soil organic matter or soil carbon basically can hold on to water nutrients like a sponge. Right? literally like a sponge, and that makes them more available to the plants in the long term, but also prevents leaching, helps prevent leaching and loss to the environment. And along with those benefits in terms of the soil and the environment, we see increases in productivity with increases in soil carbon. So here's a little test. Which of these beakers of water, both containing equal proportions of soil, which has a greater content of soil organic matter? The one on the right or the one on the left? Hands up who say the one on the right. The one on the left. The one on the left? Okay. Yeah, so let's have a vote. One on the right? Just a few. The one on the left? More people are saying the left. There's actually more soil organic matter in this one here on your right. Can anyone guess why that is? The reason is, is that soil organic matter acts almost like a glue, and it binds soil particles together into what we call aggregates. And these aggregates are heavier. And so they settle out faster when you mix the soil and water together. This is what happens to a soil with low soil organic matter when it rains. You have risk of your soil running away. Here's some pictures taken by one of my students uh, from orchards here in Utah. This is the same soil type, um, a silt loam. Same soil texture, so similar sized primary soil particles. This one here on the right, your left, no, your right, sorry, um, has been under grass for many, many years and was just about to be tilled up for a new orchard. This one on the left was been in orchard production with a clean, till, clean tilled system for 30 years. Which soil would you prefer? This one, right? See how it's holding together, nice, nice structure. And these, these soils have been dunked in, in the buckets of water for five minutes, up and down and up and down. That's what Esther did. This one is pancaked. It's become flat and shiny. And basically, what that means is in a rainstorm, this would happen and the water would run off instead of infiltrating into the soil, right? So this has real practical implications to a grower. This is the same sieve and bucket test. Uh, 
that we conducted at the Caysville Orchard, at the Caysville Experiment Station. And this here, this one here on the left, was an organic orchard. And this one here on the right was a conventional orchard, just within a few feet of each other. So, and these treatments had been in place just six years. So you can see how quickly um, differences in soil structure can, can occur. And another illustration. So these were uh, shovelfuls of soil that were dug out from two different fields that were neighboring. And one had been managed organically, and the other one had been managed conventionally. And then the researcher, my former advisor, sprayed water over them with a hose pipe for the same amount of time. And this one here washed away because it had lower soil organic matter holding it together. So again, real implications for soil loss, soil erosion. So how do we increase soil organic matter? Well, one way is to use compost. And the early organic farming pioneers were big fans of compost. In fact, many of them had visited India and Asia, China, and seen how the traditional farming practice over there recycled everything. Everything, all, even human waste, was collected and, and carefully recycled back onto the fields. And so this really inspired them to try something similar back here. But compost is not the only way to increase soil organic matter. We can also grow cover crops. So cover crops, this is a hairy vetch cover crop here and here, actually mixed in with a winter wheat. These crops are grown solely to feed the soil. So this picture is taken here in Logan on the Greenville Research Farm. And all this biomass will be tilled back into the soil to feed the soil. A lot of carbon and nitrogen. This is a buckwheat cover crop. It grows incredibly fast so it can smother weeds. Diverse long rotations are also a way to increase soil organic matter. And as farming has become increasingly modernized and specialized, we've tended to sh go to ever shorter and shorter crop rotations, which has been a problem from the point of view of soil health. So I wanted to share you uh, a little bit of data from a classic experiment. This is actually in Rothamsted in the UK, close to where I grew up. And this is, this is the oldest agricultural experiment in the world. It was started in 1843 by two scientists, Laws and Gilbert. And they were interested to test the effects of the new inorganic fertilizers that were just starting to be developed and to compare those against manure, basically. So this is a little bit of the data that was collected over the last 150 years from that trial. And so on the y-axis here, you have soil organic matter in tons per hectare and time on the x-axis. And you can see that the starting place for the two treatments was the same. But over time, the inorganic fertilized treatment slowly decreased in soil organic matter. Then it stabilized at a slightly lower level than before while the treatment of the plots receiving manure continue to increase. Obviously not indefinitely, even soil has a holding capacity, uh, a maximum amount of organic matter that it can hold um, in the soil, but, but a really quite remarkable increase in soil organic matter as a result of those manure inputs. We have a large number of long-term trials in the US as well. Uh, this is a list of those that pertain exclusively to an organic conventional uh, comparison. And I'm going to show you a little bit of data from the first one here that was established in 1981 in Cutsdown, Pennsylvania. So the Rodale Farming Systems Trial, as I said, it was started in 1981, the Rodale Research Center in Pennsylvania, and they tested two organic treatments and one conventional treatment uh, in replicated plots 
uh, eight replicates per treatment. One of the organic treatments contained animal manure as an input. The other one did not. It just had uh, nitrogen-fixing clovers as part of the rotation. All of them had a maize, soybean, wheat rotation, so a three-year rotation. This basically means that after maize, you then the next pl year plant soybeans, and then the next year you plant wheat before rotating back to the beginning. They looked at a large number of sustainability indicators, including yields, profitability, nutrient cycling, soil quality or health, energy use, and carbon sequestration. I don't have time to show you all the data today, but I'll just give you a little bit of a taste. So obviously, the yields varied year to year. But here, this graph on your left shows the cumulative grain yield, all three grains averaged together from 1996 through 2014. The blue bar here is the organic treatment that included manure. The gray bar here on the right is the conventional treatment in organic fertilizers. And the purple bar in the middle represents the legume-only treatment. Uh, so you can see that the treat organic treatment with manure was really uh, very similar to the conventional treatment in terms of yields. And actually, in the, the, the last, I think since 2008, this conventional treatment included uh, genetically modified corn and soybean. So it was, you know, a, a up-to-date modern conventional system. When they looked at the revenue, the organic manure treatment uh, brought in the most dollars, followed by the legume organic treatment and the conventional treatment actually brought in the least returns. This was despite the fact that expenses were actually higher in the organic treatments. Uh, this will not surprise any growers in the room. Uh, so why is organic so profitable? Well, it's basically because of the price premiums that consumers are willing to pay for organic pro produce, right? And so, yes, these, these uh, profits that you can see are five or six times greater in the manure organic treatment are dependent on the consumer's willingness to pay more for an organic product. And subsidies are particularly large in, the gra in grains. Organic grains are actually difficult to grow, and there's a real market shortage for them. This slide uh, shows the effects of soil organic matter uh, as a result of treatment over time. So again, on the y-axis, we have percent soil organic matter, time on the x-axis. The blue line is the organic treatment with manure. The purple line is the legume treatment. And the gray line is the conventional treatment. And again, they all started out at the same point when the study was initiated. And the two organic treatments quickly increased soil organic matter by a lot, you know, a full percent. That's a lot in terms of soil, <laughs> right? Uh, however, it's interesting that the, the, the legume-only treatment looks like it's dropping off just a little bit. Um, and I think this reflects those lower yields. Because soil organic matter comes from, from biomass return in addition to the inputs, right? Conventional, uh, the conventional treatment maintained soil organic matter for um, a long time, but then started to decline just a little bit. This is only like 0.2 of a percent. Um, so not very much, but it is, looks like a, a slight decline, especially when you, you compare these. This picture was taken off Google Earth. Uh, it's, a, it's an image of a compost trial that was conducted here in Utah, established in 1994 and 1995. This, this site actually was 1995. And these little squares here were plots that received compost, composted cattle manure, one time in 1995. Fifteen years later, they're still visible from space. This is the fallow field. This, 
This, these dark spots represent the increased biomass, increased wheat biomass in those plots. And we went out there and three years running basically measured double the biomass in those uh, compost fertilized plots compared to the controls. And yields were double as well. So we now, we're now continuing to look at this. Some uh, researchers and I, uh, Earl Creech, our uh, agronomist, extension agronomist, and local growers, we're trying to replicate this. We have a, um, a multi-million dollar grant uh, from the USDA to do that. However, you will hear in the news that uh, yields are often lower on organic farming systems, and that's perfectly true. And this, this paper that came out recently in Nature in 2012 uh, basically represents a meta-analysis of all the good quality studies that have been published comparing uh, the yields, crop yields, between organic and conventional farming systems. And so you can see that worldwide, when you look at all crops worldwide, organic yields are on average 25% lower. The difference is a little less when you just look at US crop yields. And then if you break the different crops down into groups, you'll see that it's highly crop specific. So tree fruits, there's really no difference. While vegetables and cereals, quite a, a significant difference. And this represents, you know, the, these types of crops, cereals, vegetables, are highly uh, uh, nutrient demanding, right? For nitrogen and phosphorus in particular. And so, uh, at least in some environments, organic farmers have trouble supplying sufficient nutrients from organic materials alone. Many people have argued the most sustainable a uh, solution would be to have an integrated form of agriculture, right? That uses the best from organic and, yes, supplements with small amounts of conventional fertilizer when needed. And in fact, that has no negative effects on the soil. And we could see equal soil organic matter in, in integrated farming systems compared to organic. And the yields then are no different between, between the integrated and the conventional farming systems. Why hasn't that caught on? It's because it's expensive, right? Uh, when you increase your rotation, you use expensive organic inputs, um, it's expensive. And there's currently no recognized label for integrated farming systems to you know, recoup that, that premium, price premium, from the, co the consumer. So I think that, that is why we haven't seen more integrated farms, even though there are a lot of conventional farmers out there who would be really defined as integrated. I think especially here in Utah, we have a lot of mixed farming still here in Utah. So this, this final example um, was published a, a few years ago. This is research that came out of Iowa, uh, Iowa the USDA ARS, uh, lab in Iowa, and this was, this was basically comparing a conventional with two integrated, what we would call integrated, uh, farming systems. So one of them was the maize soybean rotation. Our, you know, this is the, what, the most common um, crop rotation in the Midwest today. And they compared that with a three-year rotation, maize, soybean, and wheat, uh, with red clover undersown to grow into the, into the fall as a nitrogen-fixing cover crop. And then they had a four-year rotation with maize, soybean, a small grain. Uh, it was mostly wheat, sometimes oats in both of these, followed by alfalfa. So this is actually really similar to what we do here in Utah. Not, not the soybeans, but maize, small grain, alfalfa. They looked at yields and profitability and found they were similar. They looked at nitrogen fertilizer inputs and found that increasing the rotation from two to three or four years decreased the need for nitrogen fertilizer by over 80%. 
from 80 pounds of nitrogen per hectare to 16 for the three-year rotation and 11 kilograms per hectare for the four-year rotation. When they looked at herbicide applications, similar story, even more dramatic. Herbicide was reduced from 1.9 kilograms per hectare in the two-year rotation to 0.05 kilograms per hectare in the three-year rotation and to 0.03 kilograms per hectare in the four-year rotation. Energy inputs were halved as a result of these lowered uh, uh, inputs, right? Labor was higher on the longer rotations. And this, you know, this could be one of the, another reason why it's less attractive to many growers. They saw similar weed control, though, despite the dramatically reduced uh, use of uh, herbicides and also reduced uh, potential for freshwater po uh, pollution. So these numbers are pretty astounding to me. Um, it, if we are you know, running into a, an age where fossil fuel is expensive, why, why are we farming this way? And uh, maybe it'll change in the future. I certainly hope so. So what about other aspects of organic farming? Well, uh, let's talk about pest control, because contrary to some people's uh, understanding, uh, organic farmers do use pesticides. They're very different types of pesticides generally, but they do use pesticides. Um, here's some pictures, some examples of a few uh, organically allowable pesticides. This one here in the middle is a BT compound. It's a bacterial toxin, so it's natural. So that's really, you know, the definition that pesticides are allowable in organic farmings provided they're natural and they're not specifically disallowed because some, some natural things are really bad. So uh, cyanide, for example, <laughs> you don't want to be spreading that around. Or nicotine even, that's another one that uh, historic natural pesticide that is not allowed in organic farming. Uh, this one is also a bacterial toxin. This one's specific to caterpillars. This is a broad spectral uh, insect poison. Um, they're both very effective, but they don't persist in the environment very long. So that's another key difference. And so for that reason, you know, they have no residual. Uh, they're definitely more environmentally friendly that way, but they're also less effective. You have to use them more often. And so they're really used as a last resort. And uh, this picture here is an a image in showing uh, another a technology that was developed for organic farmers and then widely ended up being widely adopted by conventional growers also. And this is pheromone mating disruption technology. Um, this uh, basically works on the principle that many moth pests, uh, the females uh, emit a scent uh, to, and, rely, and the males rely on that scent in order to find the females to mate. And so then what uh, we do is we hang up these dispensers in the orchard that basically flood the orchard with pheromone. And then the males, you know, they're flying around and they end up lost and can't find the, the female. <laughs> so pretty clever. That's an example of modern technology, you know, with an eco-friendly solution to pest control. I'd also like to show you this uh, quick little video here. Um, it's a way of dispersing biological uh, pest control products, also very expensive, prone to being washed off in the, wi uh, the weather. So this is the biological pest control. The bumblebees are walking through there, getting covered in it, just as they would with pollen. It's the exit to their hive. Yeah. 
See, they're coming out of the hive, flying off, and visiting the flowers. So they're not only pollinating the flowers, they're dispersing the biological pest control agent just where it needs to be to prevent blossom end rot or something like that, right? Be a, it'll be a fungal, it'll, that was a more explanation about it, we don't need that, but it's basically a bacteria that's antagonistic to the, the, end, the flower uh, root rot um, bacteria, right? And so the, the bacteria is harmless to the bee, but then the bee transports it to the flower where it directly competes for growth with the, with the pathogen. And so uh, an example of a, obviously that's much more effective dispersal technique than broadcast spraying this very uh, expensive biological control. Let me just... There are also natural, completely natural methods of uh, uh, pest prevention. And these include various methods like crop diversity, uh, planting multiple lines or cultivars of a similar crop uh, is um, uh, one method historically used. Uh, or you can have diversity on the landscape level or the genetic level. And basically the point here is that a pest or an insect is going to be able to spread much more rapidly through this environment or this environment than this environment. And a classic example of this happening is the, the Irish potato famine, where they were relying on a single variety or strain of potatoes that was very susceptible to a pathogen. There are also natural predators out there that you can encourage. So ladybugs eating um, uh, aphids, praying mantis eating a caterpillar. Or you can use uh, um, agricultural biodiversity too. So in this case, a farmer has planted wildflowers to encourage their, their beneficials and also introduced chickens and sheep as a means of vineyard sanitation after harvest. Weeds, weed control is one of the big problems in organic farming. <laughs> and organic farmers have been amazingly uh, creative in trying to get around this problem. So this is high-tech uh, hand weeding technology. <laughs> I've been trying to encourage the student farm to build one of these. It looks like a really cool idea. It's definitely back saving. Uh, as well as various mechanical implement, um, implements for, for weeding uh, between row crops. Uh, organic farming has been criticized for relying too much on tillage for weed control, so innovative organic farmers are even experimenting with organic no-till. This is basically a roller mounted on the front of a, a tractor, and it's rolling down a rye cover crop, which basically kills it by crimping it at the stem, and then they can plant directly into this residue. However, it only works in certain climates. We're still kind of trying to tweak it to make it more consistent. So this is definitely not a, a take-home technology as of yet. So just coming to my final few slides, is organic food healthier? Well, if we look at the sales of organic produce, it continues to increase um, despite the recent down economic downturn. And when you poll consumers of organic food, they'll invariably say that the most important reason they're buying it is because they think it's better for you. So is that true? One thing we do know is that pesticide residues are lower on organic produce. And that this does actually, you know, the residues on produce actually makes it to our bodies. Uh, this study here uh, was a feeding intervention at a school where they basically uh, switched the school lunch program from a conventional uh, sourced foods to organic sourced foods just for a week uh, and then resumed to the conventional diet. And during that week, the, the pesticide concentration in the children's urine dropped. However, I should emphasize that all this does is prove that we are consuming pesticides, not that 
this is harmful in any way, right? Dose, everything, all poisons are dose, uh, um, dose dependent. And so the USDA would, would say that the levels in, you know, found on conventional produce are perfectly safe. Um, and anecdote, obviously we can't do the <laughs> direct experiments to test, but we do have uh, correlations between eating, you know, the fruits and vegetables and health. And so assuming um, we're not, you know, if that, that wouldn't be there, that positive relationship wouldn't be there if, if pesticide residues were really bad for us. Is organic food more nutritious? Well, uh, there's not a lot of evidence for that, to, to put it briefly. This is a, a study that came out a couple of years ago. It is the most comprehensive study to date, um, that, again, a meta-analysis. And they actually found that while there were few differences in mineral nutrients, when they looked at uh, secondary compounds, things like antioxidants, uh, flavor compounds, color compounds on the skin of an apple or a grape, they were considerably higher. So these numbers would be zero if there were no difference, right? And cadmium actually was, uh, which is a contaminant, a heavy metal contaminant of potassium fertilizer, was actually significantly greater on, on the conven conventional produce. And cadmium, yeah, is, is pretty bad for people if you get a high enough dose of it, cause neurological problems. Do secondary compounds contribute to human health? Traditionally, they're seen as anti-nutrients, and that certainly can be the case. Uh, they can interfere with nutrient uptake. However, there's growing evidence that at least some of them have health benefits. Um, they have anti-carcinogenic effects, immune system effects, they act as antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, as well as um, probiotics, so encouraging the growth of friendly bacteria in the gut. So this is all really new research. It's still very controversial, but it's interesting, you know, that even though we're definitely not seeing the, the uh, nutritional differences, there may be some, some interesting differences there. So just to, to summarize, uh, organic farming uh, may be sustainable, but is actually uh, based on truth in labeling, and it makes no claim, uh, at least at the USDA level, to be sustainable. Um, in fact, it's even garnered some flack for, you know, having sold out to the government and, and, and compromised its principles for this uh, basic input uh, you know, banning certain inputs and, and not others kind of approach. However, as we saw, there's definitely benefits in terms of envir the environment. Yields are lower, yes, but profitability is, is pretty good, um, especially with, with the good um, premiums that we're seeing. Health benefits are still more open to debate. And as you might have noticed, nothing in any of this about... Uh, social social benefits. When organic farmers were polled in California on their uh, um, willingness to adopt uh, fair labor practices and fair wages, they were no more willing to do this than were conventional growers. So, um, so I think that's definitely a weak link across uh, agriculture. We've had concert, uh, considerable calls then to, to go beyond organic and try and develop a, a truly sustainable agriculture that meets all of the goals. And just to, just to make the point that even if uh, organic produce you buy in the store it, it has very little difference to, to conventional produce, there's absolutely no doubt that when it's harvested fresh, that morning from your garden or a local farmer's market, it's going to taste better. It's going to be better for you because you lose nutrients in storage, in travel, and that's very well established. So I'm sorry I did take a little longer than I did when I practiced this. And um, are there any questions? Yes.
evaluate our soil and improve our soil? Well, def definitely use some compost, but not too much. So you're so, like from the kitchen compost, do we need to get manure from someplace? Either way, it really doesn't matter. But, but one important thing, I think, in Utah is to recognize we have a very dry climate. Uh, compost can contain a lot of salt, a lot of phosphorus and excessive nitrogen. And if we over-apply compost, as many organic backyard gardeners do, you know, we have this feeling that the more is better. And a lot of organic gardening sites kind of promote this idea. In our climate, we can run into problems with salt. So, enough enough. test your soil. Okay. You know, take a sample. Like yeah. Salt, take a sample and send it to the, the local soil testing lab. That's really the only effective. You're digging it up will definitely tell you how the structure is doing, but uh, won't tell you what the, the nutrient profile is or the salt levels. Um, growing cover crops then. And doing the two together, that's really the key to, to developing a balanced organic farming system. Because cover crops, nitrogen fixing cover crops will fix nitrogen out of the air without that salt input. But it takes and space. Can you just tell about back in at the end of the season? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Any more questions? Right here in the middle. Yes. Where do we get dirt from? That's a really good question. You know, dirt forms. It forms out of rock. And the action of the weather on the rock and the rain and the, the organisms growing in it, and it takes a long, long time, but that's how we get soil. It, it, it grows almost, right? Some people say it's a living thing because it grows. Excellent question. There's another one here, okay. Do you use manure, is there enough manure to go around if you went 100% organic? Is there enough manure to go around if we went 100%? Well, that, that's a tricky question. I mean, if you rely on all your fertilizer needs from manure, I would say no. But uh, what I'm trying to show in my research is that a little bit of manure goes a long way as in that Utah example, with one application lasting 15, 16, now we know 20 years. And so if we start to think about a low input system as not just being based on manure, but being a combination of manure and nitrogen fixing cover crops, and maybe even a little bit of synthetic fertilizer when we need it, right? That's, then we're talking a different kind of system than just switching out conventional fertilizer with manure, which I totally agree wouldn't work. Up there, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm confused about the term um, GMO. Would you comment on that? And here's why, here's where my confusion is. Um, last week I talked to a gentleman who spent his entire life in the Middle East running the entire country's agricultural program to try to get a total Yeah, well, it's, that's, a, that's a pretty huge question, and maybe I'll, we could talk about it afterwards. I'd be happy to, but just in real, real brief terms, uh, <laughs> simply put, corn and soybeans are cotton are the, are the three main crops that have been modified, uh, genetically modified at this point. Uh, so it's not everything. Uh, and... Uh, I would say yes, you know, if you're going to have a corn soybean rotation, those GMOs are going to be pretty essential because they have, you know, pesticide resistance built in and herbicide resistance built in. They're going to make it a lot easier to farm a simplified two crop rotation like that. Um, whether or not that's the way to feed the world, I would, I would doubt. 
Uh, it's certainly not the energy and uh, uh, <laughs> um, energy saving uh, way to feed the world, right? We recall that example where we had between 80 and 90 percent reduction in, in energy inputs with a longer rotation. So that's it in a nutshell, in my opinion, but it's very complicated and hugely controversial. So, yes. Well, it's true that uh, you know conventional fertilizer and herbicides and pesticides are all highly effective, right? They work. They work incredibly well, and so uh, that that is why they have a lot, you know, going for them. And farmers like using them. We mustn't forget that. At the same time, they are expensive. They're increasingly expensive. They are dependent on fossil fuel for their manufacture. And uh, I think, yes, there's something to be said for the fact that they enable a simplified agricultural system that could never exist in a lower input uh, scenario, right? We're replacing ecological diversity with uh, highly, uh, very powerful precision tools, but also take a lot of energy to Right? That's, that's an expensive trade-off. We've been able to afford it so far, but it's a good question how, if we will be able to in the future. Okay. Uh, we should 